from the Douglas County Courthouse at 8700 Hospital Drive, this is 8700. Hello everyone and welcome to this month's show of 8700 on DCTV 23. I'm Rick Martin. And I'm Colin Cash. Douglas County was hammered by a historic snowfall on Friday, December 8th. Up to 10 inches of snow fell in parts of the county. Down power lines and fallen trees and branches left hazardous road conditions for many to get home. Douglas County schools dismissed students early, but the conditions were so hazardous, students were delayed in getting home. The, the Douglas County government also released non-essential employees at noon. The storm took many by surprise after the National Weather Service predicted one and a half to two inches of snow was to fall. The storm that hit Friday into Saturday ranks as the second highest snow total in 70 years. The first ranked was the blizzard of 1993, where 17 and a half inches of snow was dumped on Douglas County. County Animal Services Director Francis McMullen says during the two-day storm, the animal shelter was staffed on Saturday but not open to the public, and that the animal control officers were responding to emergencies. McMullen says animal control had a higher call volume than usual, and they had picked up a lot of lost and found animals. You know, Colin, I was in the emergency operations center during the storm, and you know, I had an opportunity to observe emergency 911 operators, right. um, listening to them handle the weather right. and handle the calls that were coming in. It was incredible. Those operators received a total number of 2,081 calls wow. Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Saturday. We received a variety of calls while I was in there. Some were emergencies and some were not emergencies. The calls ranged from people wanting to report their power out to people requiring immediate medical care. Mm. But there was another big story dealing with the storm, wasn't there, Colin? That's right, Rick. Speaking of E911 operators answering more than 2,000 calls, one of those calls was, was by resident Jessica Mendoza, who lives in the Arbor Station subdivision here in Douglasville. Mendoza told the Douglas County Sentinel newspaper that she looked out her window and saw something big walking around. When she got up close to the window, she said it was a bear. Mendoza called 911 and two Douglasville police officers were dispatched. The officers did not spot the bear, but reported seeing what appeared to be a bear paw print in the snow, and they took pictures. Once the pictures were posted, Mendoza posted video and the story went viral on Facebook, being shared more than 400 times and viewed 15,000 times. Even an Atlanta TV news station sent a reporter over to cover the story of the reported bear sighting. Animal Services Director Francis McMillan says bears are in the area, but it's not common to see them. McMillan also says residents should not leave items out that would attract bears like trash, cat food, dog food, bird seed. <laughs> Coming up next is my exclusive interview with Douglasville City Police Lieutenant Brad Loudermilk, who shares how his police training kicked in during one of America's worst terror attacks, the Las Vegas shooting where 58 people were killed by a lone gunman. <laughs> Lieutenant Brad Loudermilk, first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us here on 8700. On the minds of so many people nowadays, uh, the holiday season is upon us, mm -hmm. and the threat of terror attacks, sadly, is uh, of the minds of many. With the holiday season, Christmas, it's going to be pretty special for you and your family this year, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, yes. From what I understand, you've been a law enforcement officer for, say, 20 years now, and the most intense experience facing gunfire was on October 1st, 2017, when it took about an hour and 15 minutes of a gunman opening fire on a festival of concert goers in Las Vegas, and you were one of them. That's correct, yes. 58 people were killed that day, and I can only imagine what that sort of experience was for you. You were on vacation, 
tell me, how was your, how did your training kick in? Uh, basically, like you say, I've been uh, law enforcement for 20 plus years, and uh, with that, I've been on the SWAT team for 20, for the, my, basically my whole career, 20, 20, actually almost 24 years now. Um, and through all law enforcement, I mean, I train, you train to be one aspect of, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the fight. In this instance, I was, you know, I was out there as everybody else was, just a, a concert goer, uh, just trying to enjoy some, you know, time away. And I found myself as being a, I guess, a, being a victim, just like everybody else was at the right. concert. Uh, no weapons or anything like that with me, you know, so I was just, just like everybody else. And, and I, you know, we, we go through all this training of what I'm going to do as a law enforcement, but I hadn't really put myself in a situation where I'm going to be the one, uh, that's being shot at. And then th this instance I was. And, and on vacation, it's not something you really expect, is it? Not at all. I mean, it was our third day of this concert. It was the Route 91 concert out there for my wife's birthday. Uh, she had picked this concert ven concert out of uh, just a couple friends, her sister and a couple friends. We all flew out, uh, spent three or four days out there, and this was the last uh, final day out there. Uh, everything was running smooth and no anticipation of anything like this happening. So I understand at the uh, initial sounds of gunshots when gunfire erupted you became separated from your wife that's correct we were uh in this towards the end of his this old bar stool from jason aldean uh we were standing there we were about midway through the crowd uh just it was just that night it was just me uh, my wife and her sister and uh we're just standing there and and you hear a, a couple pops and I could tell they were coming like towards, uh, towards the south, uh, west from me, mm -hmm. uh, in that direction. Uh, we were facing the stage, and I could over to towards my right, and I could I heard a couple pops, and we kind of looked at each other, and we're like, "Who's shooting fireworks?" Right. You know, and you're over there looking for the, the sparkles, and there's no sparkles. It's like, well, that's that was weird, but. The concert kept going, so it was like, well, maybe something's going on next door or something. Nothing really affecting us, so it's just we just continued to watch the concert. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, that song ends, and, uh, and his, he starts in his next song, and then that's when you hear the the uh, the pop 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 pop, you know, the constant pop, and, you, and then you look back again, thinking, well, those were fireworks. You know, yeah. I'm thinking again, well, maybe something's going on next door. He's still singing. Jason's still singing. So, And it's dark now, right? It's, yeah, it's dark. It's 10 o'clock at night. Okay. So uh, the stage is lit up and everything, and there's you know, several thousand, 22,000 of us there. So mm -hmm. it's pretty packed. The shots ring out. Again, they start ringing out. About that time, that's when uh, Jason Aldean turns, and he runs off stage, and the lights shut off, and it goes pitch black. And the floodlights towards the crowd comes on. Uh, and at that time, that's when my wife, she had her cell phone. Uh, she started uh, videoing because okay. uh, we knew something was not right. So we start kind of walking towards away from the gunfight, uh, gunfire. And then another round comes, and that's when the crowds just kind of started running. So we turn with the crowds, and we start running. And behind us, they had a, an area set up for uh, lawn chairs, like an outdoor lawn chair. Then they had bleachers behind it. But through the lawn chairs, we started running. We were in front of the lawn chairs, so we started running through the lawn chairs. She's ahead of, ahead of me. Her sister's ahead of me, and I'm, a, I'm a, you know, in the back. Uh, she goes down, as our video show her, she goes down. She trips over somebody. Mm -hmm. People were just hiding under the lawn chairs and stuff. Uh, so she trips over somebody and falls. Somebody falls on top of her. Uh, her sister does the same thing. She trips, falls over somebody. So I'm, I'm trying to pick her sister up, right. trying to help her get up. And you look up and, you know, my wife's gone. She's with a crowd and she's gone. I was like, well, we know she went this way. Let's just keep going. 
and let's get away from gunfire. You know, just trying to put myself distance, you know, right between the, me and the gunfire because I knew at that time it was it was coming from Mandalay Bay. Couldn't tell where, but I knew the consistent uh, shooting meant that he was probably barricaded himself somewhere. I'm thinking rooftop. He's uh, barricaded himself on the rooftop, and they just can't get to him. That's why they, you know he's still shooting at us. Uh, so we follow the crowds, um, and there's like one way in and one way out. Mm -hmm. they, the, all the gates were locked. There's a main entrance to this place, which dumped out on Las Vegas Boulevard. So we're headed towards that, that gate that's open, well, the, the entrance gate. And then we come, I guess there's another gate we, we'd come to, and it was shut. As we go through, we get to that gate, uh, they open the gate on the Las Vegas Boulevard, and me and her sister walk out, and there was police officers standing there. And uh, he, he basically kind of stopped us and told us we need to run east. He's like, no, run east, or stop, run east. So we had already exited the venue at this time when we went back into the venue. I still okay. hadn't seen my wife. Still more or less looking for my wife than I was anything. Yeah, we need to keep moving, but i got to find my wife. Uh, come back through, in through the venue mm -hmm. and uh, headed back towards the bleachers, behind the bleachers. I could know if we could get behind the bleachers there again. That's, that's putting a little cover between us and the gunman. A little, I find a steel, concrete, metal, anything I can put myself uh, right. between me and gunfire. So we stopped there, and basically I got her sister, you know, kind of trying to hold on to her, and I'm trying to call her with my phone. Well, the phone systems are overloaded, so nothing's going out. Mm -hmm. So I'm try four or five times, and it finally goes through. And out there, the venue had behind the uh, bleachers was a set, I think, five palm trees, real tall palm trees. So I call her. I'm saying, uh, come to the palm trees. She's like, I'm standing next to a palm tree. I said, well, come to the third one, you know. And she probably wasn't 50, 100 feet from us when I found her. You know, once I find her, finally, she was in the same place, basically. Once I got her on the phone, she wasn't. 50, 100 feet from us. The three of us get back together. The shots are still ringing out. And you could tell by the directions that he was shooting in multiple directions. And you could tell by the gunfire, and then plus you could smell the smoke from the gunfire, from the, the, the bullets ricocheting off the asphalt. That, the venue is asphalt, so bullets were ricocheting, so you can kind of tell that it's coming back this way, we need to keep moving. So at that time, we decided we had to keep moving. Uh, we're really not safe here. So we go down past a couple little, uh, uh, I don't know, little trailers, I guess, where they're selling stuff out of. You go back through there, back towards the most, I would say the most north uh, east corner of the property. Still inside the gate, but there was two trailers back there, like classroom trailers, like school trailers, mm -hmm. classroom. And so we got in between there, and uh, and there's a couple other people. Actually, there's another off-duty officer standing there. He's like, "Hey, you know, we're good here. He, them bullets can't reach us here." So we we hunkered down and stayed there until the uh, the shots just completely uh, stopped. Wow. Now, I could imagine this went on for, like I mentioned um, early, like an hour and 15 minutes. What was the feeling like when you reunited with your wife? Uh, you know, at the time, it was like, you know, I, I guess your adrenaline's going, everything, okay. you know, you just, I don't know, you're, my training is in, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to stay calm. Mm -hmm. uh, the relief, you know, okay. you find, I found her relief. I knew the three of us could get out of there together. That, that was our main, uh, main goal. Uh, was to get out of there together and, uh, and and safely, you know. Now, look, I happen to you know work with you personally, so I know how popular you are, and I could also imagine you're a family man and you have a couple daughters. And once they got wind, were they trying to? I do. Uh, yeah. It, the time we made it, we got outside the venue and made it back. Uh, we walked back to our uh, hotel at that time, which is about a mile and a half away. But we we walked back. 
And by the time we got back to the the hotel, I guess, you know, Facebook. Facebook, I guess, is the most, and it's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning here. It's 10, 11, it's about 11, 11.30 there. So uh, we're looking at a time difference. It's like, well, you know, Facebook is is all over it. You know, we're like, no, we're good. We're good. You know, people are reaching out on Facebook trying to, to, to get a hold of us. So, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't hit me till we got back to the room. It was like, and our flight left early the next morning. So I was like, we got to get a couple hours sleep, mm -hmm. uh, get back on, you know, uh, and I had read a, a post that she had, she had wrote on Facebook about it. So yeah, okay. it, it was, it, you know, it, I know it bothered them. I didn't know how much. And but because of the stories they were hearing back here, wow. she told me the first story they had heard was an office, an off-duty officer was uh, killed, which he was, but it was an off-duty Las Vegas officer uh, was killed out there. And, and but all they heard was an off-duty officer was killed, and all she could do, you know, think that, that was me, uh, which, which is really touching to, to see uh, what she had wrote to me on Facebook, you know. But it was really touching to. To, to reconnect wow. and let them know uh, that it, we were okay. I can only imagine, I can only imagine. And it seems like really instinctively, and it probably, and you could tell me a little bit more, but just hearing how, um, hearing how you responded, I guess you, you owe it to the training here you received? Oh, well, absolutely, I would, you know, Keeping calm, keep calm, keep moving. I mean, I saw, I saw a lot of people, you know, that were doing what I call the old tornado drill. They were taught in elementary school, you know, that's all they teach in schools is tornadoes, tornadoes. Uh, they're just doing the duck and covers. Everybody was ducking and covering behind anything, which panic had set in, but I knew that just remaining calm and keep moving was was my safest, uh, our safest way of getting out of there. Wow. Tell me a little bit, of, um, Lieutenant Loudermilk, uh, uh, you just returned from Las Vegas, you and your wife uh, returned and felt the need to go back again. Tell me why and tell me what it was like. We did. Uh, like I say, we, you know, the night, didn't really get any sleep that night. Uh, Sunday night, our flight left out Monday morning, so uh, before we could even settle in, we're back on the plane headed back this way. Uh, get back here, uh, and it just kind of starts settling in what really happened. You know, you still, we're still learning stuff every day about what really happened. Questions, you know, uh, what did I see? What did I miss? What, you know, for me as a law enforcement, I, I, I try to analyze everything. So the first chance we had to go back, you know, we felt that, you know, we needed to go back. Uh, they were having some little ceremonies uh, going on out there, a, a lighting of a tree that uh, the little park that they had, somebody had donated to the city of Las Vegas, where they put out, they planted 58 trees, and then they were dedicating the, the park that night with the lighting of the tree uh, from the mayor. She was out there. And so they just kind of <clears throat> turned out that, that that would be a, a good thing for us to go out there and do. Go go out there, retrace our steps, uh, see what we missed, see what we were looking at the night of, and then go visit uh, with these other families that have lost their lives, and, you know, lost loved ones out there, and uh, just just to try to try to get answers for ourselves. You know. What was, um, I guess there's some memorial sites that was there? There are, it's uh, 58 angels uh, dedicated after the 58 uh, uh, that were killed. Uh, the officer, of course, that really touched me, was uh, the officer that, that got killed out there. Uh, Charleston Hartfield, he was, uh, I mean, that could have been me. Uh, so to get out there and to, to meet some of these family, I met a, an off, uh, an off-duty uh, fireman. His wife was killed out there, but he was there with his two kids or his three kids, uh, and just to talk to them and to connect with them. Uh, that you know we were all there together. Uh, it's just you know 
and we try to try to stay together. Everybody tries to try like a family. You know, you turn into a family. You experience you experience something like this together. It, it draws all everybody together and as as a family. And you know, the fifty eight angels trees was the the ceremony that uh, at the park was that was a very neat experience for us. You may have touched on this, and I think you have, but I want to ask it again. How has this experience changed your life? It's just, I guess, the little things don't don't really bother family, love. Uh, I mean, you things. Life is life is short. Uh, life is short. Uh, live it to your its fullest, uh, and family. You know. Seems like that's a good message to share with uh, the citizens and I guess those we work with here in Douglas County. Absolutely, yeah. And the community has been uh, very welcoming. And I, I hear from, uh, well, from you. You know, I hear <laughs> from people I've never met before <laughs> and, and different things that, uh, about this experience. You know, I was just out there. I was just one of, of many of those out there. But yeah, the coming home of the community, the welcome of the community has, has been really touching as well. Lieutenant Loudermilk, I uh, thank you enough for taking the time for joining us. Um, and uh, again, thank you and I wish you the best. Thank you. My pleasure. Welcome back. Douglas County Board of Commissioners honored school bus driver Sharonda Richardson this month for her heroic actions in quickly helping three students offer bus after a fiery crash in November. Commission Chairman Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones and the Board of Commissioners recognized Richardson at the beginning of a regularly scheduled board meeting. Richardson was also presented with a proclamation to become an honorary state fire marshal. Nice. The crash happened on November 10th when police say a driver ran a red light at Maxim and Old Alabama Roads and struck a pickup truck. That pickup truck was pushed into the side of Richardson's school bus. She was carrying three students at the time from Turner Middle School. None of the students or Richardson were hurt. After the crash, many hailed Richardson as a hero, but she said she was no hero. Her babies were the heroes for listening. Richardson says the experience of being recognized was the proudest moment of her experience with this near tragedy. Douglas County Commission Chairman Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones and the Board of Commissioners were recognized recently by Democratic State Representative Roger Bruce during a recent listening session on legis legislative priorities for Douglas County. State Representative Bruce says he likes what he sees in Douglas County and how things are operating. The meeting was part of an annual event when state legislators come to the county to hear what elected Douglas County officials and state officials want to fight for when the legislative session begins in January. The meeting occurred at the Douglasville Conference Center. The Douglas County Board of Commissioners Finance Department released a memo in November to the Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Douglas County announcing a great deal of progress made in balancing the 2018 budget. Mm -hmm. This update comes after the county administrator, along with the finance staff, presented a proposed draft budget for review on Tuesday, October 31st. After several discussions with Board of Commissioners Chairman Dr. Ramona Jackson-Jones and staff, the finance department released an updated proposed budget and memo explaining the update in detail. A copy of the memo and updated proposed budget can be found online at www.celebratedouglascounty.com or in the Finance Department here in the courthouse. The public attended a budget hearing where a couple citizens spoke against the released budget. The budget adoption is scheduled to occur on December 19th at 7 o'clock during the Board of Commissioners' regular scheduled meeting. Thank you for joining us here at the Douglas County Courthouse Studios for DCTV 23. I'm Colin Cash. And I'm Rick Martin. See you next time on 8700.